Refreshing. Mm -hmm. I see it. We are moving. Okay. And uh, how's the audio? Let's see. Are we audible? Are we clear? The yep. audio seems good, yeah. Okay. And is people moving around the cloister? Yeah. Perfect. All That's right. Welcome back, everyone. Than... So, welcome everyone again. And <laughs> and who could say it, but here we are. And once again with Pentiment, the game that we can never have enough of. And this time again with our luxurious guest, Adam from Ludo History, that doesn't need any introduction. But please, Adam, do you mind to introduce yourself again? Yeah. Uh, my name is Adam, if this is your first time tuning in. Um, I have a graduate degree in medieval history and cultural heritage studies. Uh, I played Pentiment when it first launched uh, about a year ago now. Uh, I had a fabulous time with it. This is probably my favorite historical game, period. Uh, and I am thrilled to have been invited here uh, to join Sasa as we go through it again. And of course, the the very master of the Jedi Council here, Alex, is with us today. So. Um, Yes, uh, recapping from two weeks ago, if I remember well, um, it was a very bad day for nobility because some some no, members of nobility died in the in the common room, if I remember well, and of course it's our obligation to try to find out what happened. We went autopsy and we went uh, spindling, and today very probably we are going launching. So, who could ask for more? Exactly. So. Uh, I, we, we had a busy morning, so I think we should just go have some lunch. Yeah, let's take some energy. We need to save poor Piero from execution. Mm. Will a monk will ex be executed for something like this in, in a real case? I've never thought um, about it. Almost certainly. Uh, the game has an interesting uh, relationship with law in that it kind of leaves ambiguous whether we're working under secular imperial law or whether we're working under canon law. Uh, this is a period where that distinction is also struggling and kind of breaking down. Uh, but regardless, murder is a big deal. Murder inside a monastery is a big deal. Um, and if they are able to get a scapegoat for it, um, throwing someone under the bus and executing them is... Well, within the jurisdictions of the judge who's operating it, uh, whether that's, in this case, is going to be a representative of the Prince Bishop of uh, Freiburg, who is a, a clerical authority, but also an imperial elector, or actually, I think he's not an elector, but an imperial official, so right, further blurs that line. And then as we see, right, there's various extrajudicial cases where if the judge doesn't do it, someone else might. <laughs> See. But first, just incredible artwork. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we are we have brought almost every mother in the town just to hear stories and of course <laughs> lunch. <laughs> Exactly, except for the one who is very pregnant uh, and therefore can't yeah. walk up to the shrine. And a man, and and yeah. let's go to it. Also, the kids are perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, I, I feel the need to say this every time, but Berthold <laughs> is my favorite. Berthold is absolutely perfect, and I love him dearly. I mean, video games often have trouble with, you know, depicting kids, right? I mean, it, it's not easy for every each individual individual game to do this correctly. Just like in like medieval Christian art, like children often look a bit strange. Like they often look just like tiny uh, adults in, in a way. Yeah. And in, in many games, like in, we've talked about it before, like in GTA, you can't have kids, children running around because you know you, people would drive them over or. In, in Assassin's Creed, we've talked about this on the streams before, like, kids are always, uh, you know, swindlers, or they're, you know, or, or they, they always have, like, uh, you know, 30 imaginary friends or something like that. It, it, it's, it's like a specific representation of kids. Um, but th this game, it, they, they're just, you know, <laughs> they're just greatly designed and, and a lot of fun. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is a period uh, where they're starting finally to be like, a meaningful understanding of children as different uh, than just adults, but small. 
Yeah. Like in the 12th, 12, 12th, 13th century, that is literally the thought process: is that they're they're kids, but they're small. Uh, or they're yeah. adults, but they're small. They're not developed. Uh, so you depict them that way. You educate them that way. Uh, there, I've got an example I'm going to drop here uh, of Peter Burgos, uh children's games mm, as yeah, a great yeah. example of art from the period uh, that's actually starting to understand like kids at play as mm -hmm. something like actually meaningfully different uh, from adults kind of int and what adults are doing in the same scene. It takes a while before that co drifts into educational context. Yeah. Um, but we are starting to get some of that distinction, which is, uh, I think, it, emphasizing that here uh, while letting kids be involved in craft uh, and in sort of these work practices, it walks a really good line of yeah. this changing philosophical milieu uh, for uh, childhood. Mm -hmm. Also, I love how fascinated or they all are with Seba. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're so cute. I really like that they show how children get bored about adults' conversation because they were talking about bread and children simply went honest. It's like, that's boring. Tell us a story. That's that's children for me, you know. <laughs> so the typical streaming question, what is your favorite Bible passage for today? <laughs> definitely definitely not one I've been asked before in three years of doing this. Yeah. We should get a poll going in the chat. <laughs> the Bible story. <laughs> wow. That's that's isn't, unexpected. Sorry. Isn't the one that they do tell here Lazarus? Uh but Elisha and Chariots of Fire is a good one. Okay. Not yeah. gonna lie. Okay, there we go. Let's give it a go. Come on, Elijah. <laughs> Multitudes. Nose. Wow, the art. Oh, yeah, brother. So beautiful. Fantastic manuscript. Oh, it's amazing. You know, this integration of characters in the manuscripts uh, makes me think all the time that we, we lost a big chance as humanity not to invent comic in, in the early modern history. <laughs> there's there's actually some things that look awfully close to it, like how we conceive of as comic culture. Certainly not superhero, not nearly as serialized, but like Durner sells little like 20 page pamphlets of prints basically. Uh, as, like, his first major things after finishing his training. Like, his Apocalypse Prince circulate in a form that's not entirely dissimilar to how comic runs work. So, it's like, it's not, it's not comics. But there is some trends that direction. Interesting. Um... I need someone to talk to. I think it's Lynn after some death. Um, hmm. uh, let's go polite. <laughs> Are we doing a good run or? A... <laughs> after three streamings, this guy's going is schizophrenic, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. So. Which is basically what happened when we when we did Stray God, uh, Stray God as well. <laughs> yeah, good point. I remember we did a, a, a kick-ass run of, of of Stray Gods, and then. I think it was this week that they released like the statistics, and basically, almost no one chooses the <laughs> the kick ass <laughs> options. Hey, human nature. One day you wake up well, one day you wake up red. Mm. Fair enough. And so, Adam, you mentioned you know mm -hmm. that these um, you know this, uh, I mean Sabbath's character uh, model is, is inspired by the Solomonic manuscripts, like. How about you know this 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 manuscript that they put in the game like about about the you know the the motifs are they also from the same type of of illustration or are there are there any yeah. other influences here? Um, they're they're working broadly out of the same tradition. Uh, mm -hmm. there's definitely like some bleed between 
uh, Ethiopian Solomonic uh, tradition, artistic traditions, and like Southern Coptic traditions, because those yeah. two are relatively contiguous. Uh, I'm trying to. I've been trying to find a like good uh, public domain example of an mm. actual, an actual one to show you. Oh, everyone, some of the similarities. Uh, Unfortunately, my uh, Google Foo is not doing super well uh, <laughs> to find something from this time period that's like a really good, a really good comparison mm -hmm. uh, to show. Uh, this one will work. That's 17th century, but it showcases the style relatively clearly. So, uh, using the Wikimedia Commons right, link yeah. there. Uh, you can see, right, the, the very, obviously, skin tone similarities, but also similarities in the way that they do hair and faces. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Between what you see, saw in the game, what you see with Sabat, and what you see in that 17th century one. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen, like, IRL, some 19th century gospel books from Ethiopia that have some stylistic similarities. Unfortunately, don't have, uh, those were... Not digitized, uh, and I did not get good examples of them, so mm -hmm. I can't share those resources, but there are cases. You can see at least sort of the genre they're working from. Um, there's also some Tigray, like, chapel frescoes. Uh, let's see if I can find those, because those are also very, very similar. I have to say, with everything that you say say about this game, I, I, I'm impressed more about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's, Absolutely. It's incredible. Because, yeah. Uh, and, right, the, the narrative writing team, the art team, they just all did absolutely, mm. absolutely crazy work. Uh, uh, like, I had the chance to speak to Zoe Franznick uh, yeah. and... Right, uh, Martin, one of the other narrative designers, dropped in the last time we were streaming this here. So, like, I have so much respect for the things they managed to accomplish and the, like, breadth of references that they've been yeah. able to locate. No, because, I mean... It's also not, you know, not, not the most well-known time period at all. Like, like, it's not that... I, I assume that they... I mean, it's not that they can rely on their audience to, to, to fill in gaps that they leave behind, for example. Like, cause, I mean, I mainly look at ancient Greek things, and, and you know, that there is at least some element that most of the audience will be familiar with. But, but something like this, I mean, this is absolutely amazing. Do yeah. you know, yeah. like, how many people did, like, or I mean, how big the team was, or, like, how many people uh, looked at um, historical background for it? I don't remember off the top of my head, unfortunately. Uh, I know it's not very big, and not yeah. everyone worked on the project the whole way through. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say it's around 20 people, but uh, mm. if any uh, if any devs happen to be in chat, uh, please correct me on that, because obviously we want to credit everyone yeah. for the work they did. Of course. Uh, Absolutely. Let me see if I can also find it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The full credits... So the full credits are 300-something people, uh, but a lot of those are uh, Obsidian Entertainment and Publisher mm. uh, groups, so... But the full credit uh, has been made accessible there. Yeah. And... Uh, looks like... Yeah, na there's four narrative designers. Um, yeah, I see. That three animators of the... A lot of the work was done. Uh, yeah, Kate, I know, did a lot of work, and Hannah Kennedy, uh, as the art director, did mm -hmm. a lot of work to find a lot of these historical references. That's incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we, are, we are talking about how to use video games to teach in class and, and how to use them as didactic tools. I mean, if there is one that has all the possibilities in the world, here it is. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And helpfully, 
Josh Sawyer has been super duper open about the decision making process. Mm. And actually, I know this weekend uh, on Josh Sawyer's Twitch channel is going to be doing a redux of a presentation he gave live in Prague last week uh, <laughs> on uh, sort of narrative fictions. Uh, mm. and balancing it in the game. Uh, one of my friends, Jan Kramer, uh, I know was at the talk and said it was really good. Um, so I am excited to hear it for myself. Cool. I will be if I could. I mean, wow, amazing. Um, yeah. And in the meantime, uh, here we are suffering for the neck of poor Piero and, um, Actually, we have just received the orders that people with swords are coming closer. Time is running out. Mm -hmm. So, and we're able to see exactly how little time is left. I think that's a great detail here because though this game is not precisely rushing, but there is this this continuous feeling of time clicking very well, very much as any uh, researcher knows very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Um... We do need to make sure we swing by the library as well today to go open up something for tonight. Okay, so shall we sneak in before going to bed? Uh, we need to go <laughs> in legitimately to locate the sneaky secret entrance, and then we can sneak in. Okay. Um, okay. Shall we tell him? Or, I mean, shall we go clean? Um, well, we are fooling around all the town, so why not? Exactly. Hmm. I believe in us. Uh, un well, unfortunately, I found a great example, by the way, of the Ethiopian art mm -hmm. styles uh, from uh, the Johannes Makodi uh, chapel. <laughs> There's not any images that are public domain, so right. um, we'll uh, leave that as an exercise to viewers, because uh, copyright <laughs> is like yeah. that. But uh, this is the name of the chapel. It's a little bit older than this period, as far as I know. It looks like it is. Mm, it looks like it's. Nah, actually, I don't know. Uh, there's not a lot of information easily available on that, on the age of the chapel. Um, but it is a carved, carved into a mountain. Uh, it is a rock chapel. Uh, of a style very common in sort of the older phases of Tigray travel building. Mm -hmm. So I don't unfortunately know exactly how old it is, but it it shows the style yeah, really, yeah, yeah. really clearly. No, and it's yeah, it's it's very well replicated in the game. The, like like you say, the the faces and and the uh, what's the word like the composition. <laughs> Yeah. And the motifs as well, actually. It's, it's low-key one of my favorite art styles, like, globally <laughs> in this period. Uh, and I lost my mind the, when I first saw it. Oh, are we dreaming? Oh, yep, it's time for uh, more The secrets. Ideal City. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. When are you coming home? I'll be. No, we are not telling that to our dad, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, but maybe not so ideal city if we still have to deal with our parents. <laughs> <laughs> the expectation his okay. expectations are a little bit uh high. Yeah, quite so. Um, I mean there's a, a a very blurry line between dream and nightmare, isn't there? <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. Absolutely. And when your father shows up, you know you have crossed it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> it's it's, I feel bad for him, uh, but yeah. it is, this is good, like, this is good hi from a historical perspective because these sort of very informal connections being utterly crucial for an artist to succeed. Mm -hmm. 
checks out. Uh, right, Durer actually has gets his job working in the print shop because his parents live on the same street <laughs> as mm-hmm. Anton Koberger, who's the printer that uh, he studied <laughs> under. And then Co- the main artist that Koberger worked with took Durer as the apprentice. So it's literally because they lived on the same street in Nuremberg is why Durer is able to have his own print shop 20-something years later. Mm-hmm. I really like this detail that he basically knows nothing about his fiance, so she's just a portrait in even in his dreams. Mm-hmm. They're not this definitely won't have consequences in about seven hours when we read this. <laughs> no, no, no. Foreshadowing. <laughs> Yeah, um, in the chat, Magistrisa is saying that it's kind of true of the arts now, too, and I, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, so. very much, yeah. 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 Alright, Pastor John, my guy. <laughs> another, another theoretical, right in this period, notice, uh, there's some stylistic similarities between mm. Pastor John and Sabbat, though not a lot of stylistic similarities. That's intentional, because, um... Originally, people think Pastor John lives in India, uh, but by the 16th century, they're like, no, he lives in Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. But notice he's a caricature of a good Christian king, according to the Latin European model, in Ethiopia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, visually, he doesn't actually look like Sebat, like an Ethiopian man. <laughs> he looks like a European-styled rendition mm. thereof. Which makes sense because we're in Andreas' head. I mean, we're in his dream, so he would uh, imagine him that way. Then. Yeah. Well, good point. It's there's so much there's so much really small nuance yeah. in the choices they're making for the art design um, that you can just kind of keep pulling on, and it keeps giving you stuff to work with, and I love mm-hmm. it. Also, just the. Uh... The reference to medieval painting as well, like with the, the, the perspective and the depth that looks kind of odd because they're still experimenting with it. Yeah, uh, this is this is very, very much like a 15th century courtyard villa mm-hmm. scene, <laughs> practicing linear perspective and aerial perspective as you go back into the mountain range behind you. Like yeah. it is, it's the most renaissance life. <laughs> yeah. Work, work in progress that you could possibly ask for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's kind of the art textbook, yeah. Yeah. So, no, the Baron, the certainly. People, the people don't quite sit in it correctly. Because they're no. still very flat, very printed. <laughs> Murder. <laughs> so certainly not option two, the Baron had it coming. Um, <laughs> she did have a coming though. Did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If there is something so, we agree. Uh, Powerful people, just because it's true. <laughs> yeah, uh, any of these options. Uh... Oh no. Every time. Ta- yeah. <laughs> Every time I'm in, this, this, I am in these dreams, I, I have the same problem because many times I read these sentences and I can't help thinking that this Socrates saying, and for one second it's like, really? Socrates saying that? Yeah. So, um... <laughs> I mean, Socrates might have, but Plato didn't. <laughs> oh, sure. Wow. Yeah. There I am. <laughs> I mean, he must have had some. Uh... Yeah vocabulary if he was sentenced to death because of what he said. Yeah. You can imagine. Um, it's just him. Um, <laughs> let's say authority. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure with our imperial law fun facts. Uh, <laughs> definitely. Yep. <laughs> um, reason. Wow. <laughs> Truly ruled by reason. That's a good question. Um, yep. Honesty. Uh, by the way, that's actually reflected in the game's code. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gropian's comment there. Uh, if you basically do nothing and present nothing, 
it is hard coded what the arch archdeacon is going to rule in the absence of player input. Ooh, it is not a random good. role. Uh, there is actually coded biases in how he interprets evidence and who he thinks is likely to do it. Atelia. He does not like Atelia wow. whatsoever. Wow. So wait, have you looked at the game code as well, or how do you? I've not. I've not. This is working through reports I've heard um, okay, yeah. from the devs. Uh, I've not had a chance to actually, like, decompress the game's code and take control through it. Yeah. Data mining is hard. I don't. I've not practiced those skills. Uh, yeah. No. But... It's. You know, early early game studies like we're trying to figure out how to best study games and and uh, people said you know oh we have to look at the underlying algorithms because that, that's basically you know, the, the blueprint of the game and that's what the game's meaning is all about but then you know and pe pe people basically agreed on that but then it's like okay now we have to do it now <laughs> we have to, to start reading this and finding this and it's no, i mean it's very hard to do um, yep. And I, I don't think I've seen a single analysis or something like that that actually delves into the code or the algorithm specifically. Uh, except, yeah. of course, if, if it's a, a game researcher who's also a designer. Hmm. Exactly. Um, unfortunately, it's just... Data mining tools are technically super intensive, don't mm. have a lot of resources. Mm. Uh, that's where I'm hoping um, tools like or institutions like the... Inter what is their name? Uh, they have a big long acronym that I can never remember. Uh, it's the, like the International International Council for, uh, yeah, International Center for the History of Electronic Games. That's a long acronym. Yeah. Uh, it's a long name. Yeah. Uh, they're based in the UK, but they uh, collect a lot of early video games, including oh. um, collecting. You know, breaking down and preserving source code. Oh. Uh, the Video Game History Foundation also does some mm. of the same things, and mm -hmm. they're about to release a fabulous-looking uh, digital library. Mm, yeah. Oh. Uh, but they're focused more on like press kits, paratexts, and serials mm. about mm -hmm. gaming rather than collecting the source code itself. So yeah. while they intersect and they both are doing some of that. Um, if we are able to get proper preservation standards and actually, you know, make yeah. source code, even for, you know, old out of publication uh, games mm -hmm. instead of new stuff, it would be such a powerful resource uh, to start sure. kind of advanced game studies without having to just learn how to data mine. Exactly, yeah, because yeah. it's such a big problem. Absolutely. Thank you for seeing what happened. There we go. You see the Socrates thing? I was looking at the, the, the Center for History of Gaming. Much uh, better, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not reproducing, yeah, don't worry. But yeah, we're talking more about our suspects here. Uh... Hmm. Oh, seller. One second. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Manager, so one of the nuns is notably very much not gay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, some anonymous member of Sasa has given us really, really <laughs> strong instructions on that concern. Yeah. <laughs> Uh huh. So anonymous. <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't yeah. here last time. Uh, have we encountered the? Uh, not yet, if I remember yet. well. I think we I will remember. Not, we no. no, we have not uh, opened the secret entrance yet. So okay. uh, yeah, so maybe we, we are told off next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to we need to open the secret entrance yeah. ASAP because mm -hmm. uh, I guess we got locked in this time. But tomorrow night we should. Uh, be able to break in. We have to break into the library if we want to get that scene. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I've ever tried. Is it possible to, to sneak in in the day? I mean, it's quite suicidal, but is it possible or no. it doesn't allow you? You cannot sneak in during the day, but you cannot sneak in at night if you have not found the entrance during the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I did that like on, on 
like pretty early. I think it was like literally the first or second achievement I had on the game. Yeah, it was. I was like the very first thing I discovered before yeah. I started my job. <laughs> <laughs> it happened to me as well, but just because I thought crit, that's inscriptions, that's Roman epigraphy, and there I went, and there it was. <laughs> like that. Yeah. One of the truest things I've ever seen in the on the crypt of every big cathedral or small monastery in the world, there is some Roman inscription over there, just in the foundations. It's it's like a law of nature. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Wait, I'm I'm surprised that um, it's giving us this dialogue because we hadn't done that stuff in game yet, like. <laughs> We hadn't identified Matilda or had Brother Fulford uh, dig up the occult tools. So um, did we skip, did we skip some time? I don't think so. The, no, we didn't do the digging. No, we were last thing was. Uh, oh, sorry, yes, trying to remember two weeks ago. Last thing was the autopsy, or was the? Um, uh, yeah, the last thing we did was the autopsy. Autopsy, yeah, that's it. Or the, I guess the the sitting and gossiping. Yeah, um, that's weird. But. They're giving us information as if we've done several additional things. Yeah, it's a good point because the Digan thing, I don't remember we, we did it. I mean, this is streaming, right? Not really. Is, is it supposed to happen? This should be like the last thing before judgment. So we may we may finish Act 1 today by the power of time skips. <laughs> <laughs> we summon you. I, did we, I, I forgot to check how many hours until until deadline in the, when we are sleeping. Yeah. Oh, well. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Weird. Oh well, here we are. If this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing, and um, the certain uh, pseudonymous, pseudonymous member of Sasa will have to be <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, called out in a very stern meeting. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Or we are foreshadowing the possible reason for us to be repeating Act 1 next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, but... Uh, um, Honestly, okay with it because there's a lot of game here, oh, and yeah. you know, breaking into Act Two will be very useful and open up a lot more discussion about what makes this game remarkable. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, we could make 2024 the monothematic pentiment year in Sasa. Who knows? <laughs> All right, so yeah, it looks like that. Have, have we spent that much time? I didn't think so. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Um, yeah, we'll find out real quick. Yeah, I mean, just as we wake up. Yeah. I love this design. Yeah. I'm intrigued by this metaphor as. Mm -hmm. Dreaming as as sailing as well, or like this, this boat thing. Yeah, let's check. Let's check how much time we've got and actually figure out what the heck we're doing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, and no. Seven hours remain. Yep. Yeah. We there has been so some. We have, we had we did somehow skip ahead about a day and a half. What did we did we spend so much time with this spinning thing? I don't think nope. so. Some, somehow, somehow the save file either freaked out, um, picked oh. up something you pre did on a previous run, uh, mm -hmm. and skipped us forward. Let's call it for some DeLorean magic in 16th century and say that we have time exactly. trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so we have, um, we have very little time, and our current suspects that we have discovered are Matilda mm -hmm. and Ferric. So if you want to add Atelia or Lucky as a suspect, we're going to have to do that in this time block. Mm -hmm. And first thing in the morning, unlocking the secret entrance to library. Yeah. It's no, it's, there's no reason to at this point. Uh, we can if we feel like it, uh, just to look at the crypt. Exactly. Uh, but we're not going to have a time block where we can go into the library. Yeah, there's no time. But, I mean, sorry, I must confess I'm quite addicted to the crypt thing, because I think it's one of the... Let's do it. Yeah. And any prefer a suspect to investigate for a third, apparently last one? Um, 
They all, it's, it, I feel bad no matter what we do. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, the, the explanations, right, for each of the options, right, we have Ferenc, who uh, has been being blackmailed by the power of occultism um, by Rothwogel uh, and buried a potential murder weapon in the Abbey's graveyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, the we have Matilda, mm-hmm. who was uh, assaulted by Baron Rothwogel uh, some years previously, and may be interested in revenge. But uh, you know, what was had extreme sexual violence inflicted upon her, and so I feel bad about that. Yeah. Uh, then oh, we sorry. have Atilia, um, who are. Andreas doesn't really know, but, uh, right, Rolf Vogel killed Attilia's husband uh, on his previous visit to the Abbey, uh, and he is basically... Oh, looks like you already did the crypt puzzle. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's like, it's already done. Again, Delorean yeah. magic, so sorry. Yep, it's fine. Um, it's a very nice crypt. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, let's see... Uh, Atelia, uh, her current financial and property woes, uh, mm-hmm. and her out status as a widow and social pariah and pagan, um, are fairly directly responsible to Baron Rothwogel's actions. And then we have Lucky, who uh, we had seen arguing with uh, Baron Rothwogel, but <laughs> uh, again, he was responsible for someone's death in the Steinauer family. And so, like, Lucky blames him justly <laughs> for that. So which of the four do you think is the most likely to have done it? Hmm. Uh, here, we are pretending not to, to have any favorite candidates, so... Um... <laughs> And I'm, I'm just curious because obviously you have played it tons of times more than me. So um, uh, it's supposing that you had never played it, who would you have had? Yes. Do you remember who was your first suspect the first time you played it? I, I went for Ferenc. Really? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the grounds that he has freest access to the Abbey, mm-hmm. uh, I felt real bad for Matilda. Uh, and generally, I didn't like Ferenc. That being said, um, there are consequences long term uh, if you kill Ferenc. So, you know, with the power of knowing exactly how long the game runs, um, <laughs> turns out that characters I like are negatively impacted by me killing a character I don't like. Yeah. I, I'm not proud of saying it, but I must confess the first time I played it, Otilia was my aim. For no other reason that if there is someone I can picture killing someone else with her bare hands with her. I mean, the spirit of that woman. Yeah, that is a fair enough, fair enough explanation. Uh, okay. Um, fr- frankly, the one, the one who... Um, no. Yeah. Or, I guess arguably, right, the one who already is not liked by the community and is going to cause the least disruption hmm. to accuse. You know, it's the same logic as the Archdeacon has, but uh, it is a logic. Yeah, cold-blooded logic, yeah. Matter Teresa points out a great point. What if we just called this one a freebie? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm on board with that. This one's a freebie. Okay. Don't worry about it. And you, Alex, any, any preferred uh, line to investigate? I... Uh... No, yes. Like I, I wasn't here last week, uh, mm-hmm. last time, and I can't remember everything from when I played it myself. So I'm just going with whatever you're going for. Um, um, shall we? Well, uh, one of us has to be a little size of what? I or, or we can have the the chat decide as well. Oh, that's a good point. And I think chat's in, chat's in the freebie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the only thing Chad has suggested is um, what is if we true. what if we call it a freebie? Let's blame yeah. Lenhard for it. Well, you know, well, I've got a great idea. <laughs> what if we blame Lenhard for it for no discernible reason? 
<laughs> so I, I was just checking in the graveyard of the of the monastery just in case there was any trace for the digging up. There is not because I don't remember doing it in this streaming. Just had to check. I trust so much on on changes to be staying there, but there wasn't. So yeah, unfortunately, we already. <laughs> did it apparently somehow? That's weird. Uh, yeah, that's weird. We blacked out. We blacked out, and we already <laughs> did that. Did anyone saw any blue box? Sorry. It's maintaining mm -hmm. a sense of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, Andreas just slept in a day and a half. Like. Or this character <laughs> is like it? Toy Story toys, yeah. and he's playing on his own when we just switch off. Mhm. Mm ah, uh, yeah. Uh, in the chat, Maki is saying, "Have you uh, guys ever tried writing a mystery? I'm working on one right now, and it's surprisingly hard." <laughs> I don't know about it... you. I I don't write fiction. Everything I've ever written is nonfiction. Mm. So, no mysteries for me. Um, I I like to scrap some papers time after time, but uh, I must confess I never tried any mystery story. Mm. I don't know why. I guess they must be really hard. The, the biggest mystery I'm writing is my PhD right now. <laughs> um, Fair. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I do sometimes like write like short stories or something, but it very, very occasionally. But I think mystery, I think the, the, the difficult point is there is, is one, of course, knowing your story, but at the same time is like how, which information you reveal at what point. Um, I think that that's the, you know, the, the hard part. And it, But it's interesting that, you know, we... we We've, I think we've mentioned this before, but like Pentiment and uh, both Pentiment and Stray Gods, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of months ago, like they, you know, they they both like the the murder mystery thing, and it's an mm -hmm. interesting narrative mode I think to deal with characters and to listen to characters in a way that you that you're engaged and that you're, you know, learning about them instead of you know other games where you just, um, like, you know. Like in Assassin's Creed, for example, like if you play for a hundred hours, like you won't even after that, like you won't remember fifty percent of the NPCs you've talked to, I, I guess, or like their names because they're all pretty inter interchangeable. It's all about you know going there, doing that, returning, and get your reward. But here it's more about you know like the way in which you're saying like oh these characters do this and and this is her motivation and this is what she's doing and like like it's such a it's it's an intriguing narrative mode I think to to immerse yourself in character dy dynamics. Yeah, it, I mean, right, a lot of the historical games that I've either played and really enjoyed or are actively looking forward to are also murder mysteries. Like, this yeah. is something that I think has a, like, really successful thing, uh, sort of small development. Like, obviously, you can think of, like, L.A. Noir as mm, yeah, a yeah, classic yeah. example of the well-studied right. rock star historical game yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. That is a murder mystery. That's true. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a very also... dated one, though, because at the time it was very revolutionary and like we have to look at the characters if they're lying or not. But I think yeah. it's so it's, it's ten years old, I think, at this or nine years old. Sort and of. You, exactly. you, really, you really can't tell anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then also, you know, on the very sillier, lighthearted side, something like Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Mm. Uh, very much is, you know, murder mysteries. Yeah. And upcoming, there's a game called uh, Chronique de Silencio that's set in the 1970s in really? Lyon. Mm -hmm. And uh, is, like, really richly detailed. Uh, I've gotten to uh, talk briefly with the devs about mm -hmm. their hopes for it. Uh, and they're doing a lot of fun stuff um, with sort of that generation after World War II and the yeah, cultural yeah. memories thereof <laughs> in the lens of a murder mystery. And it's interesting, because I think the reason why you can do that is exa exactly what you said, right? Since it's so focused on talking to characters, mm -hmm. you can make your characters also be reflective of the historical diversity of classes, yeah, backgrounds, yeah, yeah. professions, <laughs> yeah. and statuses uh, that exist within that time period and then well there's a whole cultural snapshot stack and you just need to figure out which one is a murderer yeah in amongst that whole squad and that gives you lots of opportunity mm -hmm. 
I guess there is also a lot of uh, very obvious power of who uh, elements in the in the MacGuffin of a dead body and who kill it. it it's really helpful to to take any any kind of plot and unfold it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just. It's not that I am obsessed with the graveyard. It's just that I got lost in my way to the <laughs> to the Amazing. scriptorium. Yeah, <laughs> this is me. I will have got lost in a monastery. Uh, uh, chat, the chat is saying I've been expecting murder mysteries to have a big surge because we've had a general uh, drought since the late 2000s and there's always a market for cozy. So sure enough, knives out and new pyro uh, pyros uh, came out. Yeah, yeah, I think. But I it, mean, it makes it, sense. It, <laughs> it also, like, I mean, if you're an indie studio and you can't simulate or design like an intricate like combat system, for example, like it's an it's a good mode to, to to rely on conversations hmm. without having to you know create intensive systems of statistics and everything like that and balancing and stuff like that it's it's, it's yeah. and still keep it engaging hmm. like it, it's yep it's a more yeah and i think it was uh, hitchcock who said that the best way to know a character is give them an excuse to to do something and say something and i mean a dead person is is certainly prompting a lot of this conversation out of reactions so yeah i guess it's mm -hmm. hard to beat as you know as an excuse to make them interact mm -hmm. yeah uh i i wholeheartedly agree mm -hmm. and oh, it's no. also right there is something to be said for the technical thing with that small teams mm -hmm. um you can't create a super um to use adam chapman's term like a, like a realist simulation yeah yeah uh of a world space when you are two to twenty people, no, yeah, exactly. yeah, doing a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. um, it's just no. that even with store bought assets, that's not feasible. Mm -hmm. um, so, but there's a, at least a perception that you're able to do, you know, ten thousand words of writing. Yeah, yeah. And then you have a visual novel. And if you want a visual novel that's a little bit less um, linear mm -hmm. than uh, a lot of them, well, a murder mystery is a great way to have players feel like they're do having agency instead of just reading cutscenes over yeah. and over yeah. and over You're again. Right. You're right. Actually, it's very telling that one of the great, most interesting masterpieces by Neil Gaiman about the, the creation of the world and, and the birth of, of Satan. I don't remember the comic, but it's basically this interpretation of the creation of universe. It's all um, threaded all around the investigation of a murder, plain and simply. And he's re-explaining the, the very beginning of Bible in a comic with uh, a murder mystery. And I hate not to remember the title right now, so sorry. But it's really easy to find. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, erudite mention without title. That's a new new style. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but there also used to be games that I remember playing as a kid, but which were also like mysteries, maybe not murder mysteries, but mysteries and all that. But that and then, if you played them, you know, a second or a third time, they would have a different outcome. So you, <laughs> you know, you you remain you remained engaged that way, which I think is a very unique way, <clears throat> or, or you know unique way for for a uh, storytelling medium to do it yeah, yeah that, that's, I mean, that, that's kind of the the, the letdown with like murdery mis uh, murder mystery uh, film right once you've seen it like hmm. the second time it's, it's not going to be as engaging um unless it's very well crafted and then you notice things that you didn't see the, the, the first time you watched it but with games you can explore that a bit more i think hmm. yeah um i mean that that also, right, thinking about, you know, different types of mysteries, right, in some ways, the FromSoft model, mm. where it's like, you know, literally existence mm -hmm. is very much a mystery. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. what the, right, it's like, the vic in Elden Ring, the victim of the murder in the game is the world. Right. Yeah. In a very real way of like this idea of this like dead slash dying world mm -hmm. and by exploring it on a grand scale, mm -hmm. uh, you slowly piece together what the heck, mm -hmm. the various versions of what the heck happened and those versions yeah. can uh, some ways change very radically. Uh, 
It feels like tapping into the same instincts there, uh, uh, though. When we think specifically about, like, historical games and the opportunities for it, well, that delves into, like, archaeology, right? I think, I guess, the way I'd almost say it is, like, murder mysteries are better for social history, <laughs> and big world mm -hmm. state, um, mysteries are better for archaeology. <laughs> that might be a hot take. Wait, wait, I haven't wait, thought which one is better for archaeology, can you repeat? Like, the, the soul's, like, big, like, world state mystery. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, yeah. No, yeah, I, yeah. No, that, that's a good, yeah, I, that's, that's, I like that framing. O on that topic, I'm gonna put a link in the chat mm -hmm. of a book that's coming out next year by a, a colleague and good friend of mine uh, on, uh, uh, you know, Elden Ring, Dark Souls, um, uh, narrative complexity, digital communities, and interpretation, which tackle some of these issues, or some of these topics. Oh, um, amazing. Well... And uh, we might actually do a live stream about that uh, in in the coming months, so stay tuned for that. But I, I agree, and it's a very, you know, the, the archaeology metaphor, <laughs> you know, to to discuss that uh, that mode of, of storytelling is is, you know, it, it's in in in, it's you know, it, it's a certain type of environmental storytelling where you pick all the pieces up together yourself and you explore them. And I think you know s several authors have used that archaeology metaphor. I think. Um, which, which, you know, is, is a great way of, of, of keep, like, like we said, keep the, 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 the player engaged, I think. Yeah. Uh, Bill Farley, right, Dr. Yeah. Bill Farley at, mm -hmm. uh, I think he's at Southern Connecticut State University, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, is a great online resource, good friend of mine, too, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> who has been putting that to the test, has a bunch of stuff with, like, Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, yeah. uh, doing the same thing, but... You know, those are very souls like Zelda's. Yeah. In yeah. terms of overall yeah. <laughs> like theme, the overall thematic space that they're operating in. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it has some stuff with Elden Ring too. It does. Yeah, uh, yeah. So if you're looking for more of that take on things, I do thoroughly recommend his channel. Yeah, we actually mm -hmm. last uh, this year we, we wrote a very small piece on something like that in relationship to the Last of Us. Um, <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. Uh, I mean, I should be able to find it. Uh, it's. I, I I love the phrase "souls like Zelda." By the way. <laughs> uh, here, here's a piece on, on the Last of Us. Amazing. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'll be interested to see what the next Zelda game comes. <laughs> looks like, because I know uh, A.G. Aonuma has said uh, more open world Zeldas are mm. very likely. Yeah. Uh, right. Do, is much currently much more a fan of that style than linear Zeldas. Yeah. So I'll be I'll be real curious to see what happens when they're not in that exact state of Hyrule. Yeah, that's true. Good point. But it might, I think it will, it'll be a couple of years uh, until... Uh, better, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I haven't even to stream Tears of the Kingdom yet. Uh, if they release another <laughs> one, it would be sad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a weird statement. I think he said something along the lines of uh, linear games are dead or something? Or, or, or how does he phrase yeah, it exactly? Uh, he, well, uh, he has... The take for all is bad, uh, yeah. but it's an exciting take for Zelda specifically. Mm. Um, uh, I am just behaving like uh, an old-fashioned father on holidays because I am following the map and I cannot find my way because um, I, I am just looking for the midwife and I think I was in the right place, but apparently I am just chasing my tail. So calling for the voice uh, of the expert. You, can you help me, Adam? You're looking. Yeah, you need to head around to the upper town. Uh, okay. So over by where you were, where the bakery is. It's okay. the next house over for that that Lucky is standing outside of. Okay. So, no, north, no, through North Town, can I get? Oh no, no. Yep, you have walk past Andrews uh, over the blacksmith. Okay. And then you can make your way over, or you can take this upper path. Yeah. Yeah, but there is way out uh, here. Or no, this is dead end. Okay. Uh, Agnes, uh, the stay in our house is the midwife. One second, just yeah. Sorry. It's fascinating, but I can get lost oh. in this map. This is me. Sorry. Sorry. It's <laughs> technically in the central town, not in the upper, not in the north town. That was my bad. Ah, no uh, oh. 
So you're looking for the stone, the stonemason house, which is actually what the magnifying glass on the map is for. Okay. Is the house you're actually going to, and uh, Lucky oh, Daynauer is the person we can investigate. Uh, so sorry, I just pushed there, but one second, yeah. Uh, I just pushed the the enter button by mistake, as I usually do. Yeah. Just let me do one thing. Yeah, I don't know how I got lost there. So sorry. Church and Rockers. Okay. Yep. But, uh, hmm. okay. <laughs> wow. What are you? What are you trying to do? Yeah, get into to the midwife as. But it's just that for some reason, I, I it's clearly something I am missing, or I am, or I am more frightened than I thought. But didn't you? Didn't we say it's central town there? Okay. You, you went to you, you went to the midwife already. Um, right, Agnes Dana is the midwife. But it's not. The, uh, yeah, but that's, then it's not so possible to investigate with her. Lucky Stainauer, the stonemason, is the person you can actually investigate. So we've got two okay. people left that we can investigate, right? Yeah. We can either uh, go to fo like follow Lucky Stainauer ar around, or mm -hmm. we can head out to uh, Widow Atelier's farm and we can mm -hmm. go talk to her. And those are the only two people that are going to give us useful things at this point. For some reason, I, I had forgotten about the midwife. I, I think that time, time warp has really affected me, so sorry, people. Yeah, central town. Lucky was over there. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Where were we doing? Things to do. I love this thinking thing. It's so yeah. so human. Yeah, mm -hmm. we we mentioned this in the first <laughs> uh, Pentiment stream, didn't we? About you know the character's interiority. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and how it's represented, and I think it's like like uh, I think I said it back then as well. Like like uh, the big game study scholar Espinar said said in 2004 that games are awful in conveying the inner lives of their characters or better uh, they, they don't even try to do it but I think we've seen with examples like this and not many others since then that it can be done but it's interesting that they usually always refer to it um, uh, you know techniques of literature to do it yeah um, mm -hmm. And and you know I, I think of all I mean, of of all storytelling media I think literature is perhaps still the one that is most adept at conveying interiority that way so it's interesting to see that mm. uh, as well and I also wouldn't know any other way to specifically instead of like voiceover acting but it's it's, mm. it's also kind of similar. Yeah, uh, I've been trying to think of like good examples that think through things I don't know in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh. Uh, does does a very like literary straightforward way, but like um, mm. uh, I've been trying to think of like games that also do it. Uh, which is I don't know. There's been some interesting things uh with like a game like Look of Hours trying to use like soul elements uh as persuasive tools, but that's not really interior lives. That's more of just. Yeah. Uh, magic, li literal magic powers, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. associated in a very religiously motivated way. Hmm. You know, an another example of techniques I've seen used is, for example, in in the new God of War's uh, games, it, the, you know, the, the codex and and or like the diary 
method mm -hmm. as uh, as well that that they you know they they collect their own thoughts on other characters and that kind of conveys how they they think and you can get like substantial you know characterization elements in those entries but it's again it's it's it's, it's yeah it's basically literary yeah yep sometimes movies have been very skillful doing that but it's true that in games it's so hard to find examples yeah, because I guess it it's it has to be very like in movies it has to be very subtle almost like oh. it has to be a very mm -hmm. like show don't tell thing like that like you have to see it on the actor's face and in games it it's you know I don't think we're fully there yet even though we are so you know we're always evolving towards photorealism but even then I think mm -hmm. you know it, there's still that uncanny valley problem that many games have. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know. Another way in games maybe that you could do it is um, to, to reflect it in the different types of choices that you can make. Yeah. Um, and but then it quite often reverts into this, or not not here, but like, like it very often just goes into a binary good guy bad guy situation. Hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Red Dead Redemption Two, for example. Yeah. Hmm. And, and and so it's kind of reductive or simplistic in that way as well. So I don't know if if we've had like a I mean, at least in my experience, like a fully like immersive <laughs> game. Hellblade. Hellblade is the closest I can think of, honestly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Where they're doing, they do some smart stuff that other media really can't. Mm. Uh, right. Because while binaural audio is starting to be um, something that you see in like born uh, digital mm. movies, etc. Really leaning into that uh, for combat. Not really something that we see in a lot of other things, but you know, the amount of work they put in with yeah. psychological and trauma consultants, mm -hmm. uh, and relying on a very specific psychological traumatized. But firstly, you know, uh, mm -hmm. having having psychosis. Um, and then being traumatized on top of that, uh, as like creating such an extreme mentality yeah. uh, that it almost becomes more possible to display it, mm -hmm. versus someone, uh, I guess, more neurotypical and someone that you want to reflect a historical average. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good point. I forgot about that. Yeah, because there are a couple of games that, like, I'm thinking of Celeste. I don't know if anyone's played it. Like the um, 2018 platformer, I think, was also yeah. Game of the Year nominated, and it's, it also deals with like depression and and, and mental health and uh, part of the the you know the interiority there is that the gameplay gets harder in certain levels, or you, you know mm -hmm. the, the platforming gets harder, or like the levels are darker, stuff like that. So that's yeah, that I guess that is a good way of putting that. And now I'm also thinking of Psychonauts, like um, uh, it's, isn't it's it, got to be a good classic example of it. Yeah, like like, <laughs> like how you know the levels reflect that. So I guess yeah, level design. Yeah, could be. I recently discovered this game called Control, which apparently has to do yeah, with yeah, yeah. Uh, paranoia about this, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, can, yeah. The Remedy, the folks at Remedy do some uh, real, mm -hmm. really, really interesting work. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, Alan Wake 2, theoretically, I've not had a chance to play it yet, but uh, I know it's supposed to, it's supposed to have a lot of that and uses a lot of the yeah. same sort of like dream logic um, <laughs> level design as a way of communicating uh, sort of mental states. So that seems mm -hmm. like the very prom. That seems to be like the industry's current solution to that. Yeah. Uh, I'd be I guess I'd be curious to see if there's a any like third or fourth modes that emerge in the next mm. ten years or so. Uh, <laughs> to try and do the same thing. Yeah. No, I've also haven't had a chance to play Alan Wake too, but it looks fantastic. And, and apparently, I've heard there's a... Oh, we have a tombstone here. Uh, <laughs> apparently, there, there's a, some Norse mythological references in it, too. Yes, uh, the fictional is not fiction. The real band that is fictionalized yeah. into the universe <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. is all Guards of Asgard. <laughs> yeah, true. But wait, I see. And also, that performance at the Game Awards ruled. 
Yeah, true. The, the, you know, the Game Awards very controversial, and and you know, but but I think whatever your your thoughts on it are, like the music is always the best part, <laughs> like the orchestra and and and, and the 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 uh, you know. Blue guy, my beloved. Yeah, <laughs> good guy. Yeah. Oh, he's fantastic. He's oh, he's, he's amazing. <laughs> I I play flute and I collect flutes and I am jealous of his collection. Oh really? Whoa! <laughs> I mean, he he upgraded this year. Like every song. He's got a he, yeah, every, yeah. yeah. He has a contrabass. Mm. It's. <laughs> God, those instruments are like ten thousand dollars a piece because they're wow. so there's they're so hard to produce in any quality because they're <laughs> so big. Yeah, but, no, but uh, they, 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 I'm jealous. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. it's it's fantastic. Ooh. Anyway, I see um, Max's comment in the chat saying, <laughs> "I wish more games would go for an engaging, believable visual style instead of." The endless quest for more photo reel. Uh, there are better places to put that massive chunk of budget besides trying to make games into movies, and some of that is the writing uh, necessary to not have it just be a follow along story like a movie. And I 100% agree. Yeah, I think too. the most interesting games are not the ones that put all of their money or budget into trying to be photorealistic. But not to yeah. say that photorealistic games can be interesting, of course, but I think in general, like. The, the 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 indie games that don't do it uh, are, are are tend to present more elaborate and more interesting narratives. Mm -hmm. Quite agree. Even even playing with okay, not realism, but trying to be very naturalistic at some points crosses the line. Um, I am just trying to remember the title. I'm um, successfully of this uh, video game quite indie, which is uh, in this island, in which you are basically this uh, first person who who is a painter, and Part of your of your very objective is to find good spots to get a good angle or to get a, get a good perspective, and many times you are feeling a lot of realism. Although most of the people are basically animal human hybrids, and no, I don't remember the title for the life of me. Sorry for my Alzheimer people. No, yeah, I think I'm not it sure either. Does ring a bell? Um, mm. uh, I yeah. see if I can find. It. Um, no. Yeah, I will. Probably I will apologize about a lot of things next streaming and I will bring the links. No, no. Okay. Just as a heads up to everyone, uh, unfortunately, I will have to get going fairly okay. soon. Okay. Okay, uh, well, then we can call it a day and, and continue next week anyway. Do uh, you agree, Alex? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's uh, good as well. I mean, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I'll be able to join you next week because I'll be traveling for the holidays at that oh. point. Uh, but we'll we'll talk we'll talk after stream to figure out what that schedule looks like. Uh, but yeah, uh, I guess we will finish off Act One next time then and kind of press into Act Two. Or hopefully some time, but yeah, the the day will come sooner or later. But yeah, exactly. and, and uh, as as usual, it was an amazing pleasure to enjoy your your encyclopedia and your head, Adam. It's uh, it's incredible to hear you speaking about this game. And uh, as for next week, um, someone who will remain anonymous, Kate, uh, is going to join us because she, uh, she has always been the the voice calling us for meeting the nuns, and she will defend her position. <laughs> and. Uh -huh. uh... Yeah, it's, uh, it's not our fault this time. We promise. Yeah. <laughs> Disclaimer. So, yeah, um, so and, and, <laughs> sorry, Alex. Uh, yeah, join us tomorrow as well for where we'll I think finish our um, Total War Pharaoh uh, campaign mm -hmm. uh, oh, wow. tomorrow. Yeah. So I think uh, it's at uh, 10 a.m. EST I think mm -hmm. uh, on this channel. So join us for that uh, and and uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if you want to uh, see more of my stuff, uh, I'll actually be streaming later tonight. I need to take a break to do some stuff in between, but later tonight I'm going to be streaming the close bait of Skull and Bones. So we'll, I'll move from early modern Europe to uh, the Indian Ocean piracy train. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. Uh, we'll figure it out. It'll be a time, uh, but you can click on the link in the title there to head over to my channel uh, to get ready for that a bit later tonight. Don't miss it, people. And thank you so much again, uh, Adam. Thank you, Alex, for and goodbye, everyone. Yep. Have a good evening.
Thanks, everyone. Bye.